Breaking news this morning out of Washington State University as head coach Jake Dickert has announced that defensive coordinator Jeff Schmetting has been let go. In their announcement this morning, WCU head coach Jake Dickert stated, I appreciate all the hard work that Jeff has had for our program during his two years here in Pullman. After evaluating our program, we have not met the standard defensively, and I felt a change was needed for the best interest of the program. I informed Jeff this morning that he will no longer be the defensive coordinator and wish him well in his future. This news comes after the Cougs' third loss in a row, their first loss at home this season, in which they lost to Wyoming 15-14. Washington State this year nationally is ranked 90th in points allowed, allowing 28.1 points per game. They are 115th in total defense with 429 yards per game allowed, 116th in passing yards allowed with 255.3 per game, 96th in rushing yards allowed and 173.7 rushing yards per game, 118th in first downs allowed, and the list goes on. And actually, only Utah State and New Mexico had worse defenses in the entire Mountain West Conference than WSU. This means that the Cougars will finish 8-4 on the regular season before the bowl game. And with this news coming, within the next week or so, we should also hear about John Matera's future, whether he will be staying at least another year in Pullman, or if he will be leaving. So with that being said, I am joined by the regular co-host Dylan Howe this week, as well as a guest, Jamie Vinnick from CougFan.com. To stay up to date on all things Cougar Athletics, make sure to like and subscribe to the Couch GM, and let's get into it. All right, Jamie, thank you for joining us on the podcast. So to commemorate the 109th anniversary of the Pac-12, Jake Dickert has now let go of defensive coordinator uh, Jeff Schmetting today with, from WSU. What are your initial thoughts on this overall season on the de defensive side, this move, and where we might see you know the team headed forward? Yeah, I, I think it's a move that had to happen. I think, you know, this Wyoming game notwithstanding, you know, it, it just it wasn't good enough um, defensively. I think there were just too many mistakes. You saw the issues against Oregon State. You saw the issues against New Mexico. You even saw the issues on the Wyoming's touchdown. I mean, I, I, you can't blame the defense for that game. But, you know, the, you do the simulated pressure. It puts the safeties and linebackers in a tough spot. You're in man coverage. You're in press coverage. There's no pressure. Tight end winds up open. Safety can't get there in time because he's playing so deep. So it, it, those are the things that are schematic. You know, I, I think that you look at the Oregon State game, fourth and six, and, and, and Bobby Terrell and Edge ends up on Trent Walker, Oregon State's best receiver. Those are just scheme things. You know, there, there's a personnel aspect to it, too. I think, you know, the path rush wasn't good enough. The edges weren't able to make enough plays. It's not, You can't all put that all in the D.C., but I, I think when you look at the body of work, there were just too many schematic issues. Um, you know, you gave up well over 400 yards a game. You gave up almost 30 points a game. You know, uh, relative to the rest of the country, this was close to what the 2019 defense was. And we all remember what a mess that team was in, in you know, wasting Anthony Gordon's 48 touchdowns. So, you know, I, I think it just, it, it just was not good enough. Um, I think there were two years now where it just wasn't quite good enough and, um, I, I think it was a decision that that Jake Dickert had to make. I, I just think they would have been, uh, it would have been a very, very poor decision to continue on with with Schmetting and expecting some kind of results to change because it just clearly wasn't going to work out. Now, obviously, there, there's a Jimmy and Joe pro problem as well with WSU. Just you know, the the, the talent was masked last season where you had a, a, edge rushers in in Ron Stone, Brennan Jackson a guy in Jaden Hicks who covered a lot of faults in that secondary. Uh, you know, do you think Jake's Jake Dickert's loyalty kind of hurt him to a degree this season in terms of maybe not making the move quick enough? You know, I, I, I think the problem would have been if you make this move, I, I think part of the problem was, is there were some, there was progress, you know, you saw it, they looked good against Texas tech and they looked good against Washington. Um, you know, they had obviously the Boise state and San Jose state games. They came back and they held Fresno State to 17. And no, it's not like Fresno State is this high-powered offense. But you saw the signs of, okay, it got a little better. The pass rush started to improve. But I think as the last few weeks went on, it, it that's where it really became clear that, okay, this is not getting any better. They're not making the strides needed. You know, if they had gone ahead and given up 20 points to New Mexico and 17 to Oregon State, I, I don't know if we're having this conversation necessarily. I think those were the two games that really highlighted – uh, hey, this is an issue. You know, you score 38, you score 38 uh, and 35 points, and you lose. Well, that can't happen. You know, you're those, you're those defensive performances away from being 10 and 2. I, I just don't know if there was a real path to firing him earlier. And I think the other part of the problem is, is 
I just don't know what the solution was going to be on staff right then and there. You know, yes, Jake could have taken over the play calling. That puts a lot on him. Defensive play calling, head coaching. You're trying to finish the recruiting class. You obviously um, have everything else going on with NIL and so on. I just don't know if there was a true avenue to really fire him and expect drastically different results. Because overall, I think the biggest issue was within the scheme that Schmetting was running, uh, which is partly Dickert's scheme. So they will have to kind of address that with whoever the new DC is. I just don't think that there was going to be some drastic, massive change uh, if they fire him three, four weeks ago. I think you would have seen a lot of the same issues because it's something that's going to need an overhaul in the offseason, not a, a quick turnaround fix. Okay, let me phrase this a bit differently then. Okay, let's go back to being eight and one. We've seen some of the the games, the Portland State game, the San Jose State game. You've got possibly a, a chance at the college football playoff in your hands. Why didn't Dicker just grab the reins and decide, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna play call here the last two three games? And that's a fair question. And I think part of it is they were eight and one. I mean, I think part of it is. You know, for maybe where there were some issues, there were some flaws. It was overall working. They were eight and one. Um, you know, the Portland State game, I kind of, I look at it in a different light in the sense that there was a lot of deep bench minutes in that game. Yes, there were there were some issues, and I think now when you look back, hindsight being twenty twenty, a lot of the issues we saw against Portland State were issues that came really to the spotlight these last couple of weeks. But I just think it would have been a, it would have been. Um, I don't I don't know maybe the best way to put it, but I think to make that kind of play calling change at eight and one, it would have been a little bit again, I think it would have put a lot on Dickert. And I think at that point, again, it, it was working. I mean, up until that last you know, uh garbage time run against Utah State, they'd held that team to twenty one points. And that was an offense averaging well over thirty. I think it just would have been a a strange time to make that change. Now, had New Mexico and Oregon State happened earlier. If those were the two games leading into eight and one, I think there was a conversation to be had. But I think by the time that the defense, the wheels really fell off these last couple of weeks, it was at a point where a change in play calling, a change, a, a overarching change wasn't going to make that much of a difference uh, going into these last couple of games. You think it could have sent a bad signal maybe team wise that that was happening? Yeah, I think so. I think so, too. I think there's an accountability aspect. I think, you know, you, you've got it. Obviously, it doesn't matter what happens. If you're not doing the job well enough, win or loss, you've got it. Things have to be corrected. And I think, you know, Schmitt, I thought Saturday was Schmetting's best defensive performance coaching wise of the year, really up until that last play. But, you know, the body of work wasn't there. And yeah, I, I think it would have sent, you know, a bit of a bad message like, hey, we're eight and one. You know, the defense hasn't been great, but it's doing its job well enough. No, sorry, that's not good enough here. Uh, it's it, it's it, it kind of would border between not necessarily demanding perfection, but to say that at eight and one, coming off of a couple of strong weeks, this isn't good enough. You know, I, again, I think if you piggybacked Portland State, San Jose State, Boise State, and then New Mexico and Oregon State, if those were all in consecutive order to maybe start the season, again, I think there's a uh, I think there's a conversation. I think the New Mexico and the Oregon State games. Just the timing of them, it, it was it was unfortunate. Again, if those games happen in October, I think then maybe we do see a change. But I think, the, again, the wheels really fell off these last two games leading into Wyoming. That's where the issues started to pop up. And by that point, I, I don't think there was going to be enough of a uh, uh, enough time to really make a change that was going to have that much of an effect. Yeah, and really all season long, they were reliant on the clutch turnover from the defense. They had a, a few of those throughout the season. And actually a stat that surprised me is that WCU's defense was tied for 16th this year in interceptions with 14. They were averaging over an interception per game. A lot of that was Ethan O'Connor and some other guys with those big clutch plays. They had the talent there. And as you mentioned, you know, they were 8-1. They were 4-0 in one-score games up to that point. And in the last three weeks, they they lose all of those one score games. So now they're four and three on the season. So the margin of error was so small for this defense that it just couldn't pan out the entire year. Yeah, you know, it, it they like you said, they came up with some huge plays. You look at the Apple Cup, you look at New, uh, Fresno State, you look at San Diego State. Heck, you look at double overtime against San Jose State. Yeah, you know, they, every opportunity they had to make a clutch play, they did. You know what what would happen in the first. 55 minutes or 50 minutes they would make up for if there were issues with that one big play and 
you know, they did have some big plays in the last two weeks. You know, the Buddha alley to pick six. You know, that I at the time I felt like there's the play. That's the one that wins them the game. They escape and so on. I mean, they made a million against Wyoming. Again, it's I can't that last defensive play aside, which again I think it is more of a points to the larger scheme issue. I can't put last week on the on the defense. I just you can't do it. I think it was just yeah. it was if they hold Wyoming to 15, if you would have told me that before the week, I would have said Washington State wins by four touchdowns. There was just no way you thought they were going to score 14 points. So, but I think again, it, it it comes down. You look at they lost to how many three the last three games on the last drive, and the opportunities were there to make that play. And that's what they were doing early in the year. They had that one last play. They didn't have it against New Mexico when they had it, when they had, you know, the chance to get a stop and win the game. They had chances again against Oregon state fourth down plays, get a turnover, get the ball back to the offense. Um, and then they had a chance against Wyoming. All they needed is a fourth and 14 stop uh, and the game's over. So the opportunities presented themselves and it was a matter of, they didn't have those clutch plays left. And again, I think part of that falls on, the defense make more plays earlier against New Mexico and Oregon State. And I think part of it falls on the offense. You know, we, we saw the offense go in reverse against New Mexico in the second half. You know, Kyle Williams, of all people, fumbles at midfield against Oregon State. And then, you know, obviously this last Saturday, 14 points. So it was a mixture of a lot of things. But, no, they relied so heavily on that one big turnover late. Um and, you know, three straight, again, game-winning drives by the opponent, and they just they didn't have that one more play. And it highlighted, I think, some of the issues with the defense. Let's talk about some of the vitriol we're seeing on social media uh, in regard to Jake Dickert. You know, you, you can't judge uh, how the fan base is feeling strictly off of X or, you know, diehard coups on, on Facebook. Uh, but there's a lot of folks that are upset obviously with the collapse um, you're not going to fire an eight and four coach, especially with what WSU is going through. He's going to be here next year. Um, let's talk about how, how hot is that seat next year with the PAC 12 being able to be christened in, in 2026 and um, you know, just kind of explain what, what we've seen online uh, from angry Cougar fans uh, in regard to Dicker. Yeah. It, it, quite frankly, I think the seed is ice cold. I just, again, as you said, eight and four, that doesn't get you fired at Washington State. And but I, I understand, you know, the vitriol of that eight and four season feels very underwhelming considering what it was, considering what you were able to do early and what you couldn't do late. You know, I, I think the feeling is probably different if you go eight and four, you lose to Washington, Texas Tech, and Fresno State, but then win these last three games, it's okay. It, it, the feeling's just different. It, it's there's still disappointment, but it's not the. I think part of what has made so or added to so much of the frustration is you were eight and one, and you felt like the college football playoff was within grasp. All you had to do was beat three teams that aren't going to bowl games, uh, and you didn't beat any of them. I think that's that's the thing. If they lose that New Mexico game and then beat Oregon State and Wyoming, all right, you're ten and two. New, upsets happen. If you lose one of yeah. these last three, that's college football. Weird things happen all the time. But losing all three, considering what happened last year and what happened the year before, that suggests a troubling trend. And I understand why there's frustration. I mean, this is three straight years now where the team has fizzled out late in the season. It happened in October the last two years. This year they waited till November. But, you know, eight and four after being eight and one, and again, New Mexico didn't make a bowl. Oregon State didn't make a bowl. Wyoming won three games. Those are all games that were very, very winnable. And winnable not just on paper before the game, but within the game itself. You can point to one or two moments in every single one of those games that change the complexion of the game. You know, it's a defensive stop here. It's a turnover there. Um, you know, they played such clean football. And then two just devastating fumbles in the last two weeks. One by Mateer, one by Williams. So... I think that's where a lot of the frustration comes from. And I think it, it's justified. I think it is justified to be frustrated after starting eight and one and losing these last three games, because now it's, you know, you're going to the holiday bowl or the Vegas bowl or whatever. And again, you tell anyone at the start of the season, Oh, that's a good year. You know, you're happy with that. But the way it happened where it felt like there was maybe something pretty remarkable uh, on the table, 
to get to a, a an eight and four Holiday Bowl with again a weaker a weaker schedule than what you're used to. Now, they faced some decent teams this year. San Jose State ended up being a good team. Obviously, yeah, Jersey State's going to the playoff. Uh, Texas Tech and Washington are both going to bowl games. Um, I think Fresno State qualified for a bowl, so they faced some decent teams. It wasn't like they faced twelve Wyoming's. Maybe good thing for that. They may have got open twelve, but <laughs> um, I, I, I get where the frustration comes from. But uh, there just there is no world where Jake Dick. I mean, there's no world where Jake Dickert is fired in the next few weeks. Yes, yeah. um, based on uh, on field performance. You know, I mean, you know, there's always the unforeseen circumstances. Although I would be floored if anything like that ever happened. Um, just knowing the Dickert and, and who he is, but. He's going to be the head coach next year. You know, I if they go eight and four again next year, the seat's not going to change. It's going to stay warm, or it's going to stay cold. Excuse me. Yeah. Granted, next year also <laughs> tougher of a of a schedule. They go three and nine next year. They go four and eight next year. Then I think the conversations do start to begin. Of uh, you know, you should be able to do more than that. And, and if they go less than three and nine, then I think the conversations really, really begin. I don't anticipate that happening. I, I think just. Again, it's hard to say what a roster is going to look like at this or in September next year, August next year. I think the way the schedule plays out, they should have a chance to get six or seven. Um, again, we can revisit that in the summer once, you know, the transfer portal is taking its toll and so on. But um, I, I just I, I don't think the, the fire Jake Dicker conversations and I've seen them on Twitter as well. And I've seen them. You see them everywhere. They're just they're around. I, I, I don't think their conversations even worth happening because it just is not going to happen. Yeah, and I also think, too, you know, uh, you forget he did win the Apple Cup this year, and I think a lot of that has to go into the into the idea of, well, it was the second game of the season, third game of the season for the Cougs. So now you've gone eight weeks since that Apple Cup victory. You're eight and one, and now you have this slide, and I don't think people are, are remembering. Uh, he, he is two and two in the Apple Cup. Um, so, you know, that is a, a, a big-time accomplishment for a, a Washington State head coach. I was just going to say we had also been talking about his uh, record after bye weeks, and he was able to to bypass that. They were getting wins after the bye weeks. Just a little context. Right, and I think it, the coming of the year is they can't win in October. Well, then they won in October. They just left the, the issues for November. And you mentioned the Apple Cup, and I think the one great thing for Coop fans is going forward, the Apple Cup's in September. He's unbeatable in September, as we've seen the last few years. So maybe that's a trend that continues. I mean, you really, you, you do look at it, all jokes aside, 2022 to 2024, uh, September was two against Wisconsin, Oregon State, Washington, Texas Tech. I mean, he's the best coach in the country in September. And then I think it's just a matter of when other teams have started to adjust or get tape, they've got to adjust with. And I think that's where maybe you start to see some of the issues in October, November. And, and like Dickert said after the game, Last year is different. You you look at who they played in October. They played Oregon. They played Arizona. They played UCLA. You played uh, two teams that finished the season ranked. UCLA was ranked the week after they won that game. That was a different schedule than what they were facing this year. That's different than losing to Wyoming, New Mexico, and Oregon State. You know, though, I mean, those, those were three teams who I just named in October last year who were absolutely borderline elite teams. Yes, you have an Arizona State in there as well, but – I mean, we, as we saw, Arizona became one of the best teams in the country. Um, you know, had yeah. they started Noah Fafita all year last year with Jed Fish, they probably make the playoff. Um, or at least get close. I guess it was four teams. Last yeah, year. they, at least they could easily could have been a 10-2 and two team. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they almost beat Washington when Fafita's first start. They should have beaten USC. So, I, you know, I, I think you look at that, and you, you look at that schedule and this schedule, and again, it's very, very different. But it still highlights the issue of, They've got to find ways to close out the season stronger and to not lose steam after kind of coming out hot those first four weeks. WCU, so actually in the context of the Mountain West Conference, only Utah State and New Mexico had worse defenses than WSU. Even 3-10 and 10 Nevada, 3-9 and nine Wyoming were allowing fewer yards per game than this Cougar defense. And you talk about the finish to, to the season. You know, they gave up 360 rushing yards to New Mexico. They gave up 79 combined points to New Mexico and Oregon State. And then, of course, we saw Wyoming. And both in both the, the Oregon State and Wyoming games, the team was able to just drive down the field and do what they wanted to in that final drive to win the game in both of those. So, yeah, it, it's, it, it's infuriating. But kind of pivoting a little bit, how do you think this affects maybe how the transfer portal looks for WSU 
compared to if they had won some of these last few games? It's a good question. I, I think, again, it, it's hard to say, uh, you know, kind of just uh, directly because how much are the players really valuing those three wins in, in the sense? And let me that that's let me rewind that. That's not what I that's not what I'm trying the point I'm trying to get across. But do those three wins, do those three games, does that change whether or not they want to be at Washington State? I, I'm not sure it does. I think guys who were going to transfer for whatever reason probably were going to do so no matter what these last three games looked like. Guys who wanted to stay probably wanted to stay um, and still want to stay. So now, could there be an anomaly in there? Could there be a guy who said, you know, I felt like we were going to go 11-1 and and have a shot at the playoff. Maybe this just isn't going to happen here. I think that's possible. Um, And and I'm just – and this is pure speculation. I'm not – you know, I don't know. I haven't heard anything regarding the portal yet. Again, I think you'll start to see some stuff maybe leak. um, And then obviously it opens up next Monday. But – I don't know that this these three games are going to really affect the decisions. Again, I think it's so much of it is driven by by the financials, by you know guys looking for playing time and so on. So I, I don't I don't see it having a huge impact. Um, but it's it's a crazy world, and there could be a a coach that comes into a Wazoo player and says, "Well, hey, you guys, you know, couldn't finish the season. You know, come here, you'll finish the I mean, something like that. But I, I don't think that's going to be the big selling point again I think if guys are leaving they're either going to be going down a level to look for playing time or they're going to be getting considerable NIL offers to take a step up in level um, and do what you know Josh Kelly and Cam Ward did last year and, and tying that into John Mateer, um, you know obviously he's he's the biggest uh, player we have he's leading the nation in total touchdowns uh, ahead of his former uh, protege and uh, Cam Ward um, obviously Paul Sorensen earlier this year stated already a million dollar offer on the table. Um, I, I, I do look at the aspect that the Cougs were able to get that Northern quest NIL deal. And I, I think that bodes well for them this off season. Um, you know, I've heard that they they've had the opportunity to, to redo that deal. It's a one year deal he's on currently. Um, what, what do you see in terms of Mateer? Um, obviously Greg had a great article earlier this, uh, you know, a, a day ago on the pros and cons, uh, you can check that out on kookfound.com. Um, again, 75% off right now. You have to be a insider to get that information, but, uh, yeah, kind of just touch on, on Mateer and, and what we expect to, to happen. Yeah. I mean, it, it's obviously, it's the big question. I mean, it's the thing that everyone has been kind of now starting to wonder ever since it became clear how good he is and how explosive he is and how much, um, you know, kind of uh, prominence he came to. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't have any, you know, secret knowledge on that. I mean, I, I'm, you know, in the same boat as everyone else, you know, very curious. All I will say, I will say this, though, you know, I think there are a lot of guys in the country who would be doing what John Mateer was doing at, at a Washington State would see the dollar signs, and that would be it. Game over, done, didn't matter. I don't think it's that cut and dry with John. I think there is a different aspect to him, just in his personality, just in his competitiveness, his edge, his loyalty to Washington State, that gives the Cougars a a punching chance to keep him. I mean, I I don't think it's a – there's a lot of people who believe it's set in stone. He's gone, you know, as soon as the portal opens, um, we're going to see him bolt. And I'm not saying that – isn't going to happen. I mean, I'm not saying don't worry. He's staying. I'm not saying anything like that. I just don't think it's as simple as he's got more money from a school with a better football program. He's gone. I don't think it's that cut and dry. I think there's a lot that's going to go in his decision. I mean, as you mentioned, Dylan, Washington state has put together or the Cougar collective, I should say, has put together NIL packages for John. He's, he is being highly uh, compensated here um, and is given these opportunities. And, you know, the, the thing that I think we are seeing some guys start to realize is the grass isn't always greener. We put out an article on Coop Fan every year about guys who transferred and guys who decommitted and how that worked out. And a lot of the sentences and the statements I write is, well, it didn't really. And some of those are guys who dropped down a level and it just they weren't able to compete at that level either. But there are a lot of examples of guys trying to get to a bigger stage, trying to get to a bigger program. Um And it ends up backfiring. I mean, the guy I keep pointing to was a UNLV transfer this past year named uh, Ricky Johnson. He committed to Washington State as a transfer cornerback, had one year left, was probably going to play a pretty big role in the defense. 
He gets an offer from Michigan, flips to Michigan. He's played 20 snaps. Um, and, oh. I, you know, you get you get why a guy goes to Michigan. They're the defending national champs. I'm sure he got compensated. They're in the Big Ten. Yes, Michigan is absolutely a bigger brand than Washington State. If you have the opportunity to play at Michigan or play at Washington State, I don't think anyone faults the kid who picks Michigan. I mean, you just don't. It's that you. Everyone would do that. But you do. You do, I don't want to say fault the kid, but it's a lot better to play at Washington State than sit on the bench at Michigan or sit on the bench at Alabama. And I think that's always the concern for some of these guys. If John Mateer goes to one of these big schools, what's to say that there's not a, a phenom freshman or that they bring in another guy, and suddenly you're sitting on the bench thinking, what did I do? It's why you see guys, especially in basketball, transfer back to their old school. I mean, we see that yeah. more where guys go somewhere. Uh, wait, I don't think I like this very much. I'm going back. I know what my role is there. And, you know, and I, again, I think John's a little different in that he is that good that, you know, wherever he goes, a team is going to anoint him as the guy. But, I, again, I think he's he is – privy enough to all of this to know that there is a risk involved you know what it, maybe he doesn't mess with the new offensive coordinator maybe the system isn't right for him so I think there is a lot that is going into his decision more so than just well they can pay me more than Washington State they play in a bigger conference that's it I'm gone so again it's uh, that, that's a long-winded way of saying it's hard to know exactly what he's thinking just that I don't think it's an automatic just he's gone forget about it that there's a lot that's going to go into this over the next few weeks to figure out where he wants to be next year. And, 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 you know, speaking of that too, is like you mentioned the offensive coordinator status and it's always funny where you can kind of circle the time of year where you, you, you think a, a head, a, a coach of yours is interviewing for another job. Obviously reports that our buckles interviewed at, at Oklahoma. Um, you know, how does that play into obviously keeping a guy because John's going to want to see if our buckle leaves who we're going to promote or, or, or hire. Yeah. And it, it plays a factor. I mean, you know, the one thing is that it maybe works in Wazoo's favor there is our buckle. Isn't the guy who recruited them. It was Morris and, and Dickert. So there is still, you know, that connection to Jake. Um, but <clears throat> he was the starter under our buckle and he his all of his snaps outside of the, the four plays he played against Stanford in 2022 we're with Arbuckle. So there is some kind of, I'm sure, um, loyalty or, you know, interest in that. And, and I think, yes, if Arbuckle does end up leaving, it does add a uh, a wrinkle to things because it, it makes, you know, it, it certainly, wherever Arbuckle goes, that school immediately becomes a player from a tier. Just out of, you know, that's where his offensive coordinator is. Um, you know, and, and then it, it may have to be a situation where, you know, Washington State's got to got to hire someone, got to get someone involved that is a good fit for Mateer and is going to give his best pitch to Mateer. And sometimes that just doesn't matter. I mean, there was all the talk last year. Uh, you know, when David Riley came in for the basketball team, Miles Rice loved everything about what Riley had to say. He would have loved the chance to play for him, but at that point, you know, Indiana's offering him a, a, a pretty penny. He's halfway down the road with them. That just it's too late. Um, so I think it's one of those things where if Arbuckle leaves. Washington State will have to move pretty quickly. I think quicker on the OC than the DC because it all kind of circles back to you got to do everything in your power to try and keep Mateer. And, well, he's going to want to know who's calling the plays for him. And it's not just keeping Mateer. It's uh, it's keeping Wayshawn Parker and some of these other weapons. You know, Chris Hudson. The, WCU has a great argument for everyone on the offense to come back and run it back with this core of guys that are going to be here with with Mateer, with Wayshawn, Chris Hudson, Carlos Hernandez, Josh Meredith, all these guys. Um, so we'll see, yeah, with the offensive coordinator, how, you know, what, what happens there. And then it'll, it'll be a trickle down effect. Do you, do you guys have any defensive coordinators in mind that might be a fit for, for WSU? Yeah, I know uh, Dylan mentioned Tim DeRuiter, um, which, you know, I, I think he's a guy who would certainly get a look. I think the concern would be his defense was not very good this year at tech, but obviously has a longstanding, uh, body of work of, of being a good DC and having success. You know, I, I, I mean, I'll have more on this on kookfan.com later, but I would think Dickert makes a call to Craig Bull. He retired from Wyoming. Does he want to still coach? Maybe, maybe not, but that's a defensive guy for you. It's Jake's mentor. I I don't think it would be an impossible scenario that if if Craig Bull uh, 
wanted to get back into coaching, would that be a job he would take to work with Jake and maybe make it a, a two-year type deal? He comes in, he kind of settles things down. He instills kind of his physicality, his toughness, everything that he did and became renowned for at North Dakota State and then Wyoming. And then you pass the reins on to someone. So I, I again, and, and he might just be done. And I, so I, I don't know anything on that. And he might just say, no, I'm good. I'm enjoying watching football, golfing, doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, it may just, you know, be, be good uh, in retirement. But I, I think Dicker would be remiss if he didn't call him. And then, I mean, I would assume he will at least, you know, just just put the feelers out to see if Bull's interested. I mean, wow. just again, with their connections and, and, and so on. I mean, that's, I, I think if anyone, if there was anyone who could uh, lure Dickert or uh, lure Bull out of retirement, you know, save for Alabama calls him, I guess. But I think it would be to work kind of in a, in a role with Dickert in this way. Wow, that's that's an interesting hire. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite twi- Twitter personalities within Wazoo is Wazoo Jobu. Um, you know, he's got a lot of insight into football over the years. And, and he, he said one thing about the defensive coordinator, just because we're in this gap year, it's a little bit of a weird year. It, you you got to look at dudes that are out of a job or at an FCS school or maybe a former D.C. coach that is a position coach now. Because, you know, if you're going to go talk to a Mike Schur at UNLV, it's, it's a lateral move, you know, for, for that guy. Um, so. Kind of, kind of dive into that aspect of maybe where you're you're putting the flashlight uh, for the DC. Yeah, and I think there's a, you know there's a balance that you have to find with that. They went with the former DC this past time with Schmetting, a guy who had been at Auburn, had been at Boise State. It didn't work. It, it just it obviously wasn't good enough. So I kind of have a I feel like you know again bull notwithstanding, Dickert might be looking for. Uh, something else uh in terms of his past quick question when is this uh when does this go like publish uh publish live in like an hour okay i just want to see before i because i i have an article coming out with uh with some dc names i don't want to reveal okay. all of them yeah so no no worries them. no worries just yeah so at bowls one there's a couple other younger guys again i'll uh i'll tease that to others that i have in mind check out kookfan.com to find out who they are um, guys I think could be interesting fits. So I tend to think he might be going for the up and coming FCS guy or the, you know, the former or like the, the top tier position coach, uh, at a school that he's got ties to that stuff like that, rather than, you know, try and, and circle back to a Schmet or to a Schmetting type, you know, and that's kind of where maybe Deruder or even Scotty Hazelton, who uh, Jake has raved about as a mentor, you know, you just worry has the game passed those guys by a little bit to where, you know, the success that they had at, at previous stops maybe isn't just isn't there anymore. And I don't know that for a fact, but I do wonder if, again, after kind of seeing, you look at the OC versus the DC. OC, he went with a young up and coming guy. And granted, he was hiring to the Pac-12 at that point, a little bit different, but I, I think he might be inclined to go with kind of the, the DC was something to prove. Uh, you know, maybe again, a, a, an FCS guy that's done great things or uh, a lower or a lower end FBS guy. You know, I think there are still some schools where you could pick off a, a good DC UNLV, probably not, but maybe something towards the Midwest, some of the Mac or conference USA schools that have had good defenses, uh, you know, position coaches again, that uh, are up and coming or on the rise that are looking for their first shot as a, as a DC. So I, I do think the options there, but no, this is not a situation where, you're going to be able to go into a UNLV and just pick off their DC. It just isn't going to happen. Um, you know, bar, barring some kind of ridiculous, uh, you know, pay raise, which Washington state can't really offer. Um, so, you know, it, it will be, a, I think a unique or creative way to find the new DC. And, and Jamie, you, we appreciate your time. We've already had you for 30 minutes. I want to take too much of your time up here. He's, he's the, uh, the man that is covering the entirety of Pullman for us. Does a fantastic job via kookfan.com. Um, let's just jump right into basketball. Um, they play tonight at Nevada. Nevada uh, has a couple very good non-conference wins so far. Uh, that are led by Kobe Sanders, a six foot nine, do it all point forward. Um, and right now, very shorthanded uh, on the Cougar side of things. Case why not uh, did not travel. He's in concussion protocol, did not make it to Nevada. 
Cedric Coward out indefinitely uh, in terms of what the coaches have come out and said. That's the only thing we've heard in terms of the timeline on his injury. Um, and then Marcus Wilson is is still out. Uh, so obviously an extremely small bench, and you're you're getting into the biggest portion of the schedule, uh, the games that um, David Riley set up uh, in order to to put yourself on the bubble. What what does WSU have to do over these next two or three games where they have Nevada, uh, Boise State, and Northern Iowa? Uh, do you think if they can get one win out of this, they'll they'll take that and 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 try and hope for for dubs against St. Mary's, Gonzaga's of the world, and and San Francisco in conference play? I mean, give us the the, the spiel of of where we're at. Is the season hanging in the balance right now? It's it is a tough spot to be in. I mean, going Nevada's really good. I mean, just really, really good. Um, and remember how big Washington State was last year? Nevada's that big. I mean, they are huge as a team to a point where if you have Watts and Cal Isaiah Watts and Nate Calmese on the floor together, someone's guarding a guy four inches taller than them. So the matchup is not it's not a good matchup for Washington State. It wasn't a great matchup with Cedric Coward. Without Cedric Coward. I, again, basketball's weird. You never know. I have a tough time seeing this one uh, going in a friendly direction. Boise State, I, again, I don't think is out of the question. You know, they, but again, it's a good team. They they beat a really good Clemson team. They've got the same guys we've seen for years, the Degan Hearts of the world, the Omar Stanleys. Um, again, you're on the road. I don't see a lot of potential in either of these games. I I think what they're going to have to try and do is keep it close. Um, You know, at least make the metrics look pretty. Northern Iowa's winnable. I I think that's a game that, quite frankly, they're going to have to get. Um, You know, and and that's still, they still have Missouri State and Washington before that. Missouri State, I mean, that shouldn't be an issue. Washington, who knows? I mean, I, I think, again, with Cedric Coward, that's a great matchup for the Cougs. Without him, it gets a little bit interesting. You know, I don't think Washington's been great this year. I mean, they did just beat Colorado State and Santa Clara, but Colorado State. No pun intended. Uh, (laughs) Santa Clara does not look like the – I mean, I think a lot of people expected Santa Clara to to push Gonzaga and St. Mary's at least a little bit, and they did not look good. So how much stock do you want to put in those wins? But that's getting away from the point. Um, I think they need to – Again, under operating under the assumption they lose these next two. I, I just don't see a lot of uh, possibility to beat Nevada and Boise State. They need to probably take two of the next three between Missouri yeah. State and Iowa, Washington. Preferably, they take all three. That would be, I think, a re- I think that would be huge. But anything less than two and three, and then you start to get into some trouble because you know this is the the unfortunate truth of the WCC, and it's a it is a lot better league than maybe a couple years ago or what it's been perceived as. But the, the opportunity for the big wins just aren't there the way they were in the Pac-12. And part of that is, you know, who's the big fish? Gonzaga. I mean, again, let's let's call a spade a spade here. Gonzaga is a pretty far uh, bar above where Washington State is right now. And that's with Cedric Coward. Without him, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, and then you, so if you can't beat Gonzaga at least once, then you've got to run it up against St. Mary's, San Francisco, uh, Oregon State looks to actually have a decent program this year. And again, yeah. that's just that's asking a lot. And again, with I think they've got five non-con games left. I think they've got to get at least two. You know, if, yeah. if you if you beat Boise State, you can afford to lose to a Washington or Northern Iowa. Um, same thing with Nevada. They they've got to go two and three through this stretch, preferably three and two. I think if you start talking about one and four, I mean zero oh and five would be pretty would be pretty devastating to lose at home to Missouri State, who is a decent program, but... Quanzo Martin, you cannot kill him. He just oh. always comes back. I was I, I was looking at that, I think, uh, last week. I said, oh, my goodness, he's still around. But you go one and four in these next five, you're, you're probably in some pretty hot water um, unless you can absolutely run through the WCC, save for Gonzaga. Well, Jamie, really appreciate your time. Thank you for coming on. You're going to be the first call for anything breaking news in over the next week as, as we hear more about the transfer portal and the new hires. Again, thank you for your time. And if you're watching, check out kookfan.com. Make sure to go subscribe. They got all the details. 
We'll see you in the next one. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.